Daniel, Mr. Saito, uh, thanks so much for being here and taking your time out of your extremely busy schedule to actually, you know, uh, just be present and uh, help us learn about your life and about your successes and your experience. Thank you for having me, Natalia. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great day in LA today. Sunny skies as always. Uh, last I checked from Tokyo, it was raining. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, it's, it's summers and in Tokyo can be horrendous and hot, so it's good to get a change and it's nice sunny weather. It's always welcome. Today's going to be a little bit different communication that we usually have because some of the, um, our investors actually asked, you know, because they know about your involvement in, you know, in Sega, they know your involvement in uh, MySQL database, but very few actually know about your crypto adventure, I would say, or crypto career. So I would like to actually maybe ask you a little bit of questions you don't mind about crypto and how did you get into it? Well, I uh, got into it first like anyone else reading the white paper. Yeah, I thought it was a very innovative idea, forward thinking in that sense. Uh, the Bitcoin white paper was, uh, was very interesting and well written and it was something that I wanted to take part in. Um, 2009 is when I got first introduced to it. Um, it was in 2010 where I was dared to actually buy crypto. And it was right after my exit with my SQL, and as I was, I was looking at what should I purchase or invest in, and Bitcoin was one of those mm -hmm. uh, opportunities. And how did you learn about Bitcoin in the first place? Well, you just read the white paper, and then you, and then you follow up and read and research other articles about other crypto projects or other ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I think crypto is one thing, but I think the projects behind them are a whole different things of what they're trying to address. And, I think the, the second opportunity where I delved back, back in was probably the Ethereum ICO. And when, when was that? What year was that? Was that was back in 2014. Okay, there you go. And so uh, uh, Ethereum's ICO was, you know, uh, really well done. It took four days to close, and the average price of ETH was around like 32 cents or something mm -hmm. like that, given that the current price of it being, what, 1,500? It's, it's crazy how mm -hmm. the growth of that and... Uh, I mean, it has a lot of utility. Um, others deem it as a security, um, but uh, let their opinion be their opinion. But um, in a sense, Ethereum is, 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 is a great coin in that sense, mm -hmm. and hence the second leading crypto project in, in the community. So. And uh, so, when you, but also you were mentioning when we were talking earlier, you said that you were started coding uh, when you were in, as a kid, right? You really started getting into that space from very, very early on. Right. Um, I've been part of the whole. I guess I'm probably a generation PC in that sense. Um, grew up during the time of the crypto, rev not the crypto, but uh, the PC revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the PC revolution. Uh, it was the 8086 processors and the 8088 processors and literally the, the advent of the personal computer um, using MS-DOS or DOS for that mm -hmm. matter. Um, and uh, I think the most uh, influential individual probably during my time frame there was probably my brother's science teacher mm -hmm. and uh, gave the advice to my parents or my dad buy a PC and, and my father took that advice and bought a PC and the first uh, two days we were tinkering with it not knowing how to work it. It was just a green screen, monochrome, uh, Sanyo PC and it was, it was clunky. We didn't know how it worked or why it worked so like any natural kid we took it apart. It was probably about a $5,000 computer back then, and Dad walked in and seeing this computer disassembled, <laughs> um, gutted, literally, he freaked out. I bet. <laughs> and that was probably the beginning of my career in computing. Wow. And yeah, we were Did able to- Did you build it back together? Yeah, we were able to put it back together, minus a few screws and chips, but <laughs> um, it worked, right? That work exactly how it came out of the box, but it worked, um, and it's fine. And that, you know, that's all about the whole pursuit of hacking it and and debugging it and see where you're going wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you're also involved in the Bitcoin mining operations, right? Right. It was in early 2011 and 2012 where we're just designing mining bricks for clientele that were interested in mining around the world. 
So would you say your career is more development and invent invention, or it's more like on a business side, uh, uh, from like in a more investment point? What's your biggest passion is in life? Um, I do the contrary and play. Mm -hmm. I actually do something that the norm doesn't. So um, when everyone's um, buying certain items, I do the direct opposite in that sense. I, I basically do what everyone else isn't doing in that sense. Um, I have been investing heavily into agriculture in the, for the past 25 years, for example. Mm -hmm. um, then that, who knew that, you know, agriculture is the boom in the 2020, in 2022. So um, that's, you know, forward thinking in that sense. So it was always a good bet to bet on agriculture. But Absolutely. Um, aside from agriculture, um, traditional equity, private equity in certain startups as well. But um, I think uh, over the years it was, uh, you know, you are, you own a lot of equity in all the companies that you work on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, whether they be the MySQLs or the internet search requires you start, you're making sure that uh, you are adding value and that value translates into good equity positions. And mm -hmm. that allows you to advance your career as well as uh, pick the projects you can work on. Awesome. I also would like to know, because you worked on several hackathons, right. so which, uh, which companies and what was the experience with the hackathons? So for hackathons, uh, we did it in several countries. Uh, this is mostly probably around the 2017, 2018, when the whole ICO craze was going on. And uh, worked with uh, WAX, um, the, the, the game asset exchange. Um, and they uh, have a token, and we help them get into Asia, as well as help them uh, run these hackathons where people can design skins for games and sell them online and uh, on the WAX platform. That was a, a, a really cool thing to see the creatives from around Asia participating in that. Um, the other implementation was with our other client, Bluezell. Bluezell was a, a blockchain company that wanted to recreate the decentralized database. And uh, our duties when we came in to consult with them was um, the open source of it, what license scheme, what are the governance models behind open source code contributions, um, and everything of how to create internal workflows of how to push code into, a, you know, uh, making into a proper open source project. Mm -hmm. So with that, we came in and we worked on various uh, blockchain projects, but more on the back end side of how to manage code uh, acceptance from third party community to also um, developing code internally mm -hmm. uh, for these projects. And now these tokens are trading on Binance and they're doing very well. So, um, but yeah. And uh, so also you've uh, worked with uh, some of the people you brought to be working with right now, right? With Colin Charles and uh, Zivago. Right. Like what is there, like what, what is, how did you meet them? And not even how did you meet them, what do you think um, importance of continuing the work relationship with people that you're close to and you have done projects together? Like you're working on the Maria uh, database right now too, right? Right, so we were, early, I mean, Colin was the early co-founder and developer for MariaDB. Um, as he was also an early employee at MySQL. Um, over the years, um, I had the opportunity, and, uh, and I'm very grateful that I um, was able to work with talented individuals. And during this uh, journey, uh, you identify certain talented folks that become lifelong friends. Um, early on, it was my other friend, Z, Zivago. Uh, I've known him since junior high school. Oh wow, that's awesome. And since seventh grade, we always sat next to each other and uh, we shared notes, we studied together, we, you know, we played basketball, he's far more better of a basketball player than I am, um, but you know, he would let me play, um, he, despite how crappy I was, because I was willing to try him and be a part of a team or, or play, and, and he'd always pass the ball to me, so that's why. You know, I think that's another good reason why we're friends. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so over those years, uh, I mean, we've continued with compute, computing and or computers in general. And um, he went off in university his own route, but we always ended up in the same places. And we worked in Silicon Valley together. We've worked in the startups, numerous startups together with myself and Z. 
uh, he would I would always ideate ideas and implement them and since as they would be side hustles and um, yeah but the idea is that we always did something together in that sense and that we could work on something large scale at that the second uh, individual our CTO Colin uh, you got the chance to meet up with him um, during the MySQL time and uh, we were able to not only help build the community and open source community but be able to come up with a new business model um, and uh, how do you make money out of free software and we were able to make a billion dollar exit and we were able to reproduce that again with Maria Didi and uh, as we are slated to go public for that mm -hmm. uh, probably later this year. Yeah, that's an amazing story, I think. And so after having you know, two major exits and many other ones, do you think like, you know, like when you actually feel this, the taste of success, does it change your personality or does it change the way you live your life? Mm. <laughs> um, when it depends on success can be different at a different part of your age. Um, I had the fortunate action of being successful at a very early age. Um, when I started mm -hmm. ISP in, in Japan, when you sell your first company for fifty million, it's it's a it's a life changing moment. How do you? How old were you? I was about twenty. That was crazy, and, <laughs> um, but that was hard work. I mean, that was a lot of nights sleeping underneath a desk, um, um, literally glued in front of the terminal screen and fishing miles and miles of cabling and and just just. You know, when everyone was enjoying partying and whatnot, they were always in front of the computer, looking at code, writing code, making sure servers were up. And that was just a lot of work, but it gets compounded into good four to six years of just grit and just getting it done and, and selling out. And that was, uh, we sold the PSI net. And uh, um, soon after, of course, like all good successes comes down crashing, like um, the telco bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. crashed and therefore I had to go back to work. But I had the fortunate opportunity to work for Mr. Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch out of News Corp. Um, he was out of Hong Kong and uh, he wanted to do a joint venture with Sony, uh, Itochu and uh, ooh, Panasonic and uh, be able to create a broadcasting platform and uh, a digital broadcasting platform for satellites. So those satellite dishes that you see on the balconies in Tokyo, that's probably my doing there. So that's every time, it's a general reminder that you have satellites up in the sky, JCSAT 2 and 3, and they are orbiting, servicing greater Japan. So you just have such a fascinating background. And what do you think, you know, what's your personal opinion? What are the, you know, three top qualities, or three or five, whatever you choose to say, of success? You know, what, uh, what qualities the person or the company as operation, as an organization, should uh, have to be able to, you know, really succeed? Well, you know, I, I can't say I've succeeded yet either, so I can give you advice of what worked for me. Um, I think um, what's, what's fair for a lot of, for everyone, is that we only have 24 hours in a day. Um, and how you want to spend those 24 hours is up to you. And given that, um, but if you spend it with a good work and life balance, that's completely fine. That's the majority, and that should be the normal of, of having a balanced life. Um, being constantly working 24 hours a day or almost you know, every waking moment, that's hard. You can get burnt out, so managing that is key. Um, but, um, but it also mat matters whether if you're doing something that you enjoy doing. And uh, this is all I think about. This mm -hmm. is all I do, uh, waking up. Um, so success, um, it's, you know, once you get to one point, you always want the next thing. You always want to move something. And you always want to pursue it and then make it better or it, you work on something on your next step. Mm -hmm. So you're never satisfied. You can't, I mean, I can't say I've actually stopped and just took a breather and be like, oh, that was a long ride, because mm -hmm. the ride keeps on going. So it, it's hard to, uh, to say what exactly is success. Like, I mean, you know, the S&P 500 can drop, you know, tomorrow, and crypto markets can crash, and, you know, fiat money and, and Japan gets gobbled up in the ocean. You know, the thing is, it, 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 all those scenarios can, can happen, 
mostly in the, the, this day and age. So success is, is that an experience or is it monetary value? And if I look at it from an experience aspect, um, I had the fortune and aspects of experiencing a lot. I'm very humbled about that. Um, that I got to work in great teams with great people. And as, as much as uh, I would love to take credit for all the stuff that I've done, that was done by teams. And I had a great chance and opportunity to work with great teams. So, um, yeah, and you know, working for somebody for the longest time, having clients that you need to worry about, um, to eventually running your own company. They're all different things, but it's all the experience of, you know, whether you're working for somebody versus um, working um, for clients as well as running your own company. So yeah. they are completely different, but it is a different um, perspective from employer, employee, or contractor. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, you learn how to work with people. Mm -hmm. and build, make a business out of it. And, uh, and this is how we all have to strive. And you are only given 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And with that, how you spend the time, it's up to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Also, I guess it's uh, depending on what age you are, right? You kind of work more in your 20s. You know, then when you have kids and family, it changes as well mm -hmm. because your right. commitments and time priority changes. I, what I've, I've known a lot of entrepreneurs um, and you notice certain things and, and traits about entrepreneurs. Um, for example, Masatoshi Son from SoftBank. Uh, when he was a child, from around eight years old, he was always running a new idea, a business plan, all right? Almost kind of a, a new business idea that has value to people. And that was his thing. For every day, he would come up with a business idea, right? Uh, whether they are executable was a different question, but they were a business idea. He just trained and molded his mind to always think of new business ideas given what he saw and observed. And uh, in the sense, when I was a kid, um, I was, um, I had what I had. I was a slash child. Um, I had a farm, a little plot of land in the backyard where I would plant vegetables or, or we would have a lemon tree or avocado tree. And when it came to harvest, I would take the said lemons and go around the neighborhood and, and sell them for a nickel. And you would have enough nickels to pay for gas to go fishing. And when you go fishing, uh, you go, you know, you're, I was that kid that always had his hand in the trash can taking cans and aluminum cans or bottles out and recycling. Um, and that would pay for the next trip or pay for my allowance to do something. So it was always in that mindset of kind of being hungry, um, always. Uh, wanting to do what the other person's not doing, um, and because there's always opportunity around the corner or in the trash can, and, uh, and I learned that early as a kid. Wow, so, and do you, do you attribute that to your upbringing from the like, working out thing, so it's just you think this is just your, your personality and your nature? I think it's a lot of have to do with upbringing. Uh, my parents were immigrants from Japan, and we really literally did not have a lot of money. They, my, my dad is a chemical engineer, my mom was a housewife, later became a uh, university professor. But yeah, we were always struggling. Um, you know, well, I guess my dad was a uh, ceramist and you can only make so much, you know, and inflation being inflation and, and, and cost of everything, I mean, cost of eggs is the cost of eggs. But it was expensive having, um, you know, three kids and uh, you know, a household of five back then too. As it's probably more expensive now. So, with that said, um, <clears throat> it wasn't easy, and we always had to. We didn't have the the the, the chance to go to summer camp or or um, go on family vacations. Instead, we spent time in the backyard, trimming the hedges or you know mowing the lawn or or swimming in the backyard. And mm -hmm. that we had, and we had to be grateful for that. Absolutely. But. Uh, whether if we ventured out every weekend to a family vacation, no, we didn't do that. <laughs> I mean, even when you're in LA, it's, everything's within a driving distance. But it was gas fees, it was time, it was just, just getting there to that location and it cost money, so we couldn't do that. But in order to do that, the hustle was to, to save up gas money and, and for the money for the trip. And, 
and that's what we did. So I've done everything from trying to farm worms that failed miserably um, to um, to sell fruits, to lemonade stands, to you know building computers, selling software, uh, selling pirated software. Oops, I didn't say that, but I mean, but I mean, this is when you were kids and you were on your bike and you're selling them for fl one floppy for a quarter, and um, but yeah. That was that's, kind of... that's a beautiful story. And um, so a lot of people, you know, we have uh, with the crypto is going down and uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, younger generation that's got in into the crypto in the last couple of years, which uh, wow. uh, what do you would you ad ad advise to different, you know, the younger generation who are just getting into the crypto space, <laughs> who got burned quite significantly or, you know, thinking about getting in but afraid, what would be your advice to people in, in just in the Web3 in general, not necessarily crypto? Well, I mean, Web 1.0, I'll, I'll address it more from crypto, but more from different levels. Uh, Web 1.0 was read only, and Web 2.0 was read and write. And with Web 3.0, it's all about ownership uh, and all of the above. Um, in the sense of ownership, people do need to own a wallet, a digital wallet. There's a digital representation of yourself. And with that, uh, you get these cryptocurrencies. Um, at any given point, these cryptocurrencies are highly volatile in nature. Um, and holding it as an asset class is, is you know, up to you, as well as how much you own it. Um, but they should um, invest in more than they should plan to lose. Uh, so if it's $100, it's $100. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in that. At least you got started. Um, in regards to um, if you, the best strategy I've noticed is just dollar cost averaging and just constantly buy every Wednesday, you know, for the next 52 weeks, then you should have a nice nest day. So it's not financial advice, but if you just don't want to worry about the price of something or whatnot, just, just buy on the average. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might buy on a high day or a low day, but the idea is if you're buying every Wednesday, whether if it's $10 to $100, at least you're averaging out. And yeah, and that's a great advice. But it's everyone, any investor that doesn't, that's unsure about the market usually does that. But definitely when you have about $1,000 in your portfolio, you definitely look at the price of Bitcoin today or what the coins you might hold. But as, um, you know, you're looking at your phone more often. Mm -hmm. You notice that you're looking at your phone more often. So um, I think the folks that are getting into crypto, um, just read up and do your homework, right? I think you shouldn't ape into it right? mm -hmm. and saying, oh, it's, it just dipped right now, so I'm just going to buy. Um, that's never a good strategy because it's always going to dip. It's always going to peak, and that's, it's, uh, that's, that's how it is. And so um, whether if you're buying on a good day or a bad day, it's... You know, we are empathetic and we're happy for you if you make money, but you know, there's both ways that you can make money, even on the dip, on the lows as well as the highs. So, but if you want, it's it's your appetite for risk, and and greed, of course. So, but you know, I don't have time for that. Um, yes, I I I've dabbled in the past, and as it could be very consuming, <laughs> I just don't have time for that right no, now. No, absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you so much. I think it was very insightful. I'm sh I mean, I would actually like to, you know, to talk to you always to learn more from you because you're the most, you know, fascinating person who really understands and also very humble uh, with all your success in this. You're, I mean, from what I've known for myself, you really want others to learn from you and you're here to share your knowledge, to share your expertise and kind of help others. Right. And that's what I really admire about you as well. Well, you know, I'm always an advocate for financial literacy mm -hmm. in that sense and uh, you know everyone has to start somewhere whether they start they've already started with traditional fiat or they want to start something new with crypto mm -hmm. if anything you should never uh, stop trying to learn something new um, I think uh, if self-improvement is always you know always required whether whatever financial class that you may be in um, yeah. and just trying to do something different is always necessary mm -hmm. and you know is it a good time to buy crypto? It's always the answer is yes, and if you if you invest responsibly, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. I appreciate it.